قد جاب خواطرنا حلم يطويه تخرجنا أيام الجد قضيناها وهنا الإنجاز يسامرنا فرح قد جاب خواطرنا حلم يطويه تخرجنا أيام الجد قضيناها وهنا الإنجاز يسامرنا وعبير الأفراح ترات ومنانا اليوم يعانقنا طياب مدارسنا بذلت للعلم جهودا well, uh, we are here live at the Santon Convention Center here in Johannesburg on the GBR convention, the business convention here. As you know, South Africa is uh, the hub of the world as well, and so is Africa. But we are very fortunate here at the uh, ITV stand. We have our brother here all the way from Nigeria, Brother John De Silva, is it? Yeah, John De Silva. Uh, John Adetokumbo De Silva. That's uh, which part of Nigeria are you? Brother? I'm from the southern part of Nigeria, Lagos to be precise. From Lagos. Yeah. So tell me what's your role in this conference? You are in what, in what part are you playing in this conference here? Uh, I'm a participant. Okay. I came to explore some business opportunities there. Okay, yes. from Lagos. From Lagos. Okay, that's that's great because. Uh, but in Lagos, we just want to know in terms of uh, how's everything in the country there. You know, between South Africa and Lagos, we are the two number one or number two, the oh, biggest yes. uh, economy. Oh yes. How's the economy doing right now in Lagos, uh, in Nigeria? We are trying to move it up. Right. You know, things where we, we, we fell into recession some few months back. Right. We are up, I think, a year now. Mm -hmm. We are out of it now. So things are looking up, really. Okay. You know, things so, are looking up in Nigeria now, all, economically. Well, that's great. Well, also, while we were talking, just for the viewers to know, we were talking and uh, our brother John saw this. I mean, uh, Muslims love Jesus. And we came to realize that as Muslims, there's a lot of misunderstanding between Muslims and Christians, and there's always generalizations. People make all Muslims to be bad, or all Christians to be bad, and we know that this is not true. Oh, yes. Um, based on my experience from where I come from, mm. um, Christians, we have a lot of Christians, one part of the country, southern parts generally, right. then the other side, which is the northern part, majority are Muslims. But um, we have some of us are fanatical Christians, some of them too are fanatical Muslims. Muslims. What but, about Lagos, John? How is it in Lagos? No, no, Lagos is a liberal place. There's okay. no problem religious wise in Lagos. Oh, oh that's great. No, no, There's no. A, they are living all. in harmony there. In harmony. Just like you have it here in South, in South Africa. Africa. Well, that's how it yeah. should be. I think that yes. that's how we must have it. And I think one of the reasons this uh, this conference was arranged by a Christian oh, based yes. group as well. And yes. and we, although we ITV and IFRI, we are a Muslim based group, but we okay. felt it's time that we we start building bridges of understanding because we believe that uh, Jesus and Moses and Muhammad. Uh, and Abraham, peace be upon them all, are one fraternity. They are one family, who, who, and Abraham is the grandfather of all these prophets. Do you, is that so in Christianity as well? Uh, well, Christians, we were, uh, like I was born a Christian. Right. While I was growing up, a Catholic to be precise, I was okay. born a Catholic. Okay. So we were made, we were taught mm -hmm. to love all humanity, Great. that we are all one. Then when I grew up, I went into pe Pentecostalism, okay. where you are meant to, you know, convert whoever you meet. Okay. So that's the mentality in Christian, the Christendom. Whoever you meet. Pentecostal. Pentecostal. Even yeah, generally. Generally. If I meet you now, this actually attracted me. Okay. I was Let passing by. Let them see by. that. Yeah. This. While I was passing by, I saw this. I am a Muslim and I love Jesus. So that's why you, you, saw, you saw me come to you. Yes. And I started, you know, checking but, out on all of the okay. pamphlets there. So I'm surprised. This is the first time I'm seeing this kind of a thing anyway. Maybe it exists. Or maybe where I come from, the Muslims don't kind of reach out. Well, Brother John, let me yeah. give you the news. Okay. Sir. Wherever Muslims are, they are not reaching out. Not only in Lagos. Okay. Generally, Muslims and themselves, they do not. They are living in their own boxes, and they do not even understand their religion properly. Mm -hmm. They do not even know that every day. I'm going to. I'm going to surprise you, and you can check with any Christ, Muslim in Nigeria. You know, we pray five times a day. Yes. As Muslims. Yes. Are you aware, Brother John, that five times a day in our prayer, we are praising and sending blessings on Jesus? 
Really? Yes. In our prayer, the most <laughs> spiritual act is our prayer. We send him blessings on Abraham and the family of Abraham. And the okay. family of Abraham is Moses and Jesus and, and all of them and Muhammad. So we are sending blessings on them. Now the ordinary Muslim is doing that, but he's not aware of what he's doing. Okay. Out of the prayer, he's regarding the Christian brother as my enemy, enemy. as somebody different. I think we need to build these bridges of understanding. We have to, to make the world a better place to live in. Well, thank you very much. I know you got to go for your meeting. Yes. It's nice to see you and enjoy yes. yourself and come back to South Africa. I'll come back. I'll <laughs> definitely do. My name is King Zolake Elijah Mtetwa. I'm a believer. I'm working with Dr. Adam, who is a Muslim. And I'm a Christian. And we've maintained, we have a smooth relationship in terms of the work we're doing in the, in the business arena. And he's the man. The fact that I'm sitting here, it is because of him, he's a Muslim. And that's a message I'm sending out to my fellow Christians to say, you may have looked down upon a Muslim. You just don't know there may be just one Muslim who may be a person of your destiny, where God will intertwine the heart of a Muslim to a Christian for the execution of his mandate, the greater purpose. And the global platform that we're having here, we are sending the message to the Muslim kings, the Christian kings, to stay stop the wars that are happening in your countries. How do you do that? By coming to the Global Business Roundtable platform. One, opening doors into your countries to say, let's have a chapter of Global Business Roundtable in that particular country where Christians and Muslims are in conflict based on issues of religion. Here we are in South Africa. I am personally working with a Muslim, executing what we deem to be a godly mandate. And in your Orthodox Christians and Muslims, they would say, that's taboo. You don't have that kind of arrangement. I'm telling you, I am living, practicing that with one of the great Muslim, but who has a great heart. Let me tell you, Christians, I have not seen Christians doing, giving work, humanitarian work, like the gift of the givers. Yeah. It's a lesson for Christians yeah. to wake up to that, to say the same mandate was given to us by Jesus Christ. To say, go ye all out and make people my disciples. Take care of the poor, take care of the needy, take care of the widows, take care of those that do not have. Some of us have forgotten those cardinal principles of the gospel. But look at Muslim, when there's a disaster, they're the first one to rise up to the occasion. Yeah. We are busy probably, yes, praying about the situation. That's another component. But I want us to go beyond the prayer and probably across the boundaries in the countries where predominantly are Muslim countries. Let's go in there. But what we must do first, let's mobilize resources. Let's be hearkening to any call. It could be through that humanitarian aid that people are going to receive the message of the gospel. And by the way, I understand Muslims have no issue with Jesus. And actually they are embracing Jesus. It may be different contexts that they are approaching and perspective. But you don't shoot that down because it will all work together for good. That's a scripture saying that. So instead of focusing on the things that divide the religions, let's work on a commonality. The commonality here now, the issue of poverty. Let me bring the context. Do you know that the scramble of Africa was done by European countries where they came to the African kings and had them to sign a pact that says those, Af those European countries can now be colonizers of that African country. That's why we are in Africa, but we're speaking Portuguese, we're speaking Arabic, we're speaking Hebrew, we're speaking this and that. Why? It was because of our colonizers. But that we can use to our advantage by now saying, if the Europeans, they came here, it's because of the wealth we are having. And we, the kings, must now wake up to the reality that we're running kingdoms that are having minerals. Europe is taking minerals from Africa. Oil, natural vegetation, food. We are supplying the whole world, yet we are the poorest. Let me tell you, this poverty is state-managed. This poverty does not exist according to the provisions 
of natural resources we're having as Africans. But there is this wrong thing that we're doing as Africans. I think it has now become a spiritual issue more than it being just a, a secular thinking issue. We have to restore God in our kingdoms. Once we've restored God, God will then open our eyes and minds to wake up to say, you are rich. Do you know how the Europeans are investing in our country? They quantify the reserves of mineral. And based on that reserve, they allocate resources financially and they give you that money because they know for the next hundred years they will be reaping up a, a, a harvest of so much gold, of so much diamond. And that where does it go? To Europe. What do they do with it? Further beneficiation to make products that they bring back to Africa as consumers. We were used as Africa as colonies of settlement, colonies of, 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 of um, suffering, where they, they actually oppress us. But also we must turn that situation around to our advantage. There is still more minerals under the ground than what has already been taken. And let's rise up as kings and we change the rules of engagement this time. Don't take money per se to sell your, your minerals. Yeah. This time around, tell those who come who want to mine these minerals to say, I'm the landlord. Mm -hmm. The rules of engagement are this. He who has gold, make the rules. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's the golden rule. Mm -hmm. They must bow to your laws yes. and stop shortchanging yourself. And let's think not just for this generation, for the next generation to bequeath them with a legacy that has restored the economy back to the hands of the Africans. Africans are not poor, but it is a stage-managed thing. We thank you so much, King Mtetwa. It has been an absolute blessing having you here in the studio. قد جاب خواطرنا حلم يطويه تخرجنا أيام الجد قضيناها وهنا الإنجاز يسامرنا We are joined by Miss Sarah Muni, um, a representative, a Kenyan representative for the Global Business uh, Roundtable um, Future Leaders. Um, it's nice to have you in the program here today. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, so Sarah Muni is my name and I am from Kenya and I'm the national chairperson of uh, GBR Future Leaders in Kenya. Right. And part of what it entails is that we usually come up with programs and organize programs where we can have young people who are in entrepreneurship because very many young people are, you know, starting small business, you know, the SMEs. Then we have those who are professionals, they are in employment. So we have programs for them so that they can be able to develop their, uh, their businesses. Let's ask you the question that everybody else is asking about their at home. Perhaps somebody has not come across uh, the Global Business Roundtable in itself, oh. let alone it being in Kenya, mm. you know. Mm. It's, ha it's holding its eighth session here in South Africa right now and that's where you are. So Global Business Roundtable, let me first uh, start there, is a global organization that focuses on holistic development of, of young people or of, of its members members globally. And so we have, uh, we are, we have um, representation in over 100 countries. So Kenya is one of the chapters, the GB our chapters and we also uh, oversee the region, the Eastern Africa region. So basically um, we were very happy to have such a platform where we were, we were able to connect with very many other countries, learn what is working for them in business in different sectors of the economy and you know just exchange ideas and see and come up with workable solutions to because we have common problems as African countries. So we, we discuss together um, uh, the, the problems facing our continents and we give solutions. So in Kenya uh, GBR has taken a very big, um, has, has been taken up in a very big way and we are doing projects we are doing programs even for young people mm -hmm. yeah to be so that we can be able to learn from people who have gone ahead in business in professionals that we, we are doing and we learn from them we, we there's a lot of mentorship that goes on and there's a lot of talent development mm -hmm. yeah and also that the, the, the aspect of responsibility to be responsible citizen to be involved in national issues um, you know it's, it's a very it's something that even as young people we need to consider so that is one of the things that GBR is doing you know, giving a platform for us to you know to learn what is happening uh, out there and you know get the international best practice and apply it in our countries what are the challenges that are typically faced by the Kenyan startup that you see in South Africa seem to be less a problem or versus 
All right, in Kenya, one of the challenges that we face with the young people starting business is that, first of all, the, the coming up of business proposals. And most of the time is that we will start one business, and then when it doesn't do very well, we run into the other one, because it is not, you don't have a business proposal. That is one thing, having some, a workable, you know, a business proposal that you can be able to present to an investor. That is the, the one thing that we've been teaching people. How do you write good, how do you put your thoughts together, your, your business project together, and pitch to somebody to listen, you know? Because we have, let me tell you, in Africa, we have very many people who want to invest into, into your ideas. Because as a young person, all you have are ideas, you have energy, you have dreams, and you, you know, you have the energy to pursue them. But do you have, uh, you know, are you presenting your idea nicely? So I think that is one thing that we really need to, to, to really learn about. And I think uh, what we are seeing in, uh, in South Africa, I think we have uh, people who are very, you know, people who are very objective on what they are doing. You find our presentations there about their business, you like it. Very nice. They're very articulate about what they're doing, and they're passionate about it. I think those are some of the things that we need to learn and you know just adopt, yeah, uh, uh, in our country. And then also, it's good when we exchange ideas. What What are some of the things that are doing well? Some businesses that are doing well here in South Africa that you know we can also introduce in Kenya. We are also very keen to scout on that, you know, so that we we learn what is you know we, we learn some some best practice from here and we go and apply in our country. So we are really really keen on that. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about um, bilateral trade agreements between South Africa and Kenya and how those uh, trade agreements made by the two states um, has had positive impact within the Kenyan business community. Well, I think that's very important, but you know we have an issue here because, first of all, we cannot do business very well if even coming to the country, coming here to the country is a problem. Like for me, applying as a business person, applying for a visit to South Africa from Kenya, it takes five days. In fact, even for me coming here, we had to wait for like almost ten days to get a visa out. So, you know, it it it's such a challenge. If you know, we have to keep on waiting. Maybe we have business deals that we need to do. We have deliveries to do. We need to open up our borders we need to have ways where we can have the SADC you know and maybe because for for us we are in Comesa in Kenya we are under the Comesa block economic block we need to have some some very good integration um, um, integration we, we need to have some integration within these two blocks we, we open up our borders and let me tell you something that our, our, our president president um, Kenyatta did he opened up Kenya he opened us the doors of Kenya of business to all African countries you don't need visa to get into the country we need to open up our borders if we're going to open markets we're going to create markets and do trade with each other if we're looking at the fact that you're a stronger country as Kenyans South Africa and Ghana and other countries what then happens to the stronger countries um, won't they be more vulnerable to this decision uh, by the countries that probably have less contribution in, in the African uh, growth I think by the time that as a state or as a head of state you make such an announcement that we're going to open our borders for anybody to come and do business here, we have done our due diligence. We have had our security, uh, you know, together. We have our security um, apparatus together. And so that we make sure that people who are coming into our country, first of all, we can account for them. We know who they are and we know what they're coming to do and for how long. I think it's very important we have that database. And also um, we have, I can say about security because that's actually a very good concern. Security, you know, what, what we've it's a very relevant question to ask what about you know security maybe we are opening up to terrorists and what have you but I can assure you in Kenya we have very stringent security rules if you are entering a mall you you search for I mean there are very many others it's just one aspect but security you have to take care of security you have to invest in security and I think as a country we have really tried you know in Kenya we have we neighbor uh, Somalia and uh, as you know we have had attacks before by Al Shabaab and other you know terrorist organizations but we have been able to pull through and right now our security apparatus is very, very stringent. So anyone who thinks that they, they want to take advantage of such a chance to come and, you know, uh, do crime and, uh, you know, the, those bad things, then I think you'll be in for a very big problem. As a woman in business, what has been the challenges or and how have you mitigated your challenges? Yes, so one of the uh, challenges that we face is uh, in women in business, first of all, breaking into sectors where it's only men who has been there, like in construction, in, um, there is also the, 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 the production of, of, of 
what we can we call it liquor or what but that's yes, an area that has yes. been dominated by 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 you know by by our counterparts um, the male counterparts so breaking barriers into a male dominated industry that has been quite a challenge because you know people say you know this what this area is just uh, you know we all need to know this so and so can do it we, we have never seen you know there are very many things that women have not yet started but we are seeing a lot of uh, interest by women and women who know what they're doing mm. who are strong who mm. can take a rebuke who can take you know some really you know they, they, they are really very strong coming up and you know starting industries mm. and really inspiring very many young, young ladies and telling them you know what there is nothing that you cannot do in business there's yeah. no area you cannot do in business yeah. you have the same and you can construct this big uh, you know building like your, your brother can do mm. so I think this is really coming up in and especially in leadership in governance in Kenya we just had our first um, two women governors actually now we have three women governors and that's an area where it's only men who are who could because you know people have ne have never seen a woman governor mm. so the ladies I can't tell you there are ladies who fought for that position and they got it and they have made me believe as a young African as a young lady in Kenya and even in Africa that you know what I can also you know I can also represent my people in such a position and influence policy at such a position and inspire very many young people like me mm. yes now um, you see the thing with government services to people whether it is health what is education first of all you find that they are cheaper so most people because they don't want to spend more they, they'll just go for these services but most of the time and this is what wakes up the corporate and the and the private sector is because the services most of the time they are low you find the staff are not paid so you find them they're striking everywhere even universities our lecturers people who are teaching us business you know how, how to start a business they are striking so you wonder <laughs> Why didn't they? They're teaching me business, but they can't start there. So it's it's a challenge there. So when you find such things, so people get into universities, institutions of higher learning, for a degree of maybe three, four years, you end up finishing it seven years because of striking le lectures. And this is why you find the private sector coming up. They see opportunities. Mm. Yeah. So the the, the government uh, governments in Africa have created a very big very big opportunity in all of this. It's in health. You go to a, a hospital. It is not equipped with medicine, with all these you know um, the apparatus there that are needed for even very basic things even for a lady to just deliver yeah so the private sector has come in very strongly they offer quality they'll offer they'll give the right uh, you know they have the lights the right staff they will train, train them they'll pay them well and then and then also now for for me who is going there as a patient now I just pay a little premium so people resonate more with this because mm. with my health my health is you know I'm, I am as good as my health is. If I can get my health, um, I, I can get um, good medical services in the private sector, then why do I need to go to a government hospital? So people resonate more because with the private sector because they can see quality. They can see they are taken care of. Everybody needs to feel important. The private sector makes you feel important. You are our client. The government is like, oh, take it or leave it. Yes. Asante sana na furahia kuwa Afrika kusini. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be in South Africa. Africa Kusini is South Africa. Okay. Um. <laughs>